welcome to the Bro Novo Podcast, the podcast that models healthy communication for men, empowering them to start the journey of self-work. Now here's your host, Thomas Pierce. Okay, liftoff. Coach Lee, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me, Thomas. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to, to come on the Bruno Nova podcast, and I'm excited to hear your story and chop it up with you. So for those who are not familiar with you, you know, who, who is Coach Lee and what is your, you know, your, your story? And as far as coming onto podcasts and having a conversation with, with various folks like myself, you know, what is the uh, message you have to share in a, in a over broad overview in a broad overview i'm like wow this all i have to do is say a couple of sentences and the, the interview will be over <laughs> 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 uh, well my name is coach lee hopkins and my pronouns are he him his i help people create lasting friendships i'm also a transgender person um, from female to male and so there's an experience of vulnerability and connection that i want to share with your audience Awesome. Wow. Compact. Compact answer. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Super cool. Okay. Well, yeah, thank you for for sharing that and being yeah, just being being here as you are. You know, I, I don't um obviously and I guess it's not obvious, but I, I am a, a, a cisgender, you know, uh mm-hmm. born male man and so i don't understand or know the kind of experiences and the transformation and growth involved with being able to you know come on a podcast and say that so i don't know <laughs> if what the journey was or if you know what the process was to get to that point but kudos to you mm. uh, thank you and yeah of course and yeah i i just believe that there is a whole lot of you know it wasn't the first thing that i've done i know there are a lot of people so i'm almost i'm almost 40 years old so I've had a bit of life to experience before I, I made a transition. And I know there are some people who are much younger and they feel like they already know themselves and they're doing, they're, they're able to connect and be vulnerable and open with themselves and, and say that this is their gender. This is the real gender. Well, I have the whole process. I've had an old, ex- I had an experience where I lived more than 30 years as a female and I had to learn about vulnerability I had to learn about connection within that. And I honestly thought that transitioning was going to help me get closer to being more of my authentic self. I would thought it was actually going to be the answer. Let's say not getting closer, but more like being the answer. And I think that even though most of your audience may be cis male, cisgendered, and, and as you, the experience we can find commonality and is the fact that we believe that there's this one event or this one defining thing that's going to make us who we are. And that's just not true. That's just not true. The series of events and experiences that we have that form us and we continue to, to change throughout our lives. Totally. It's like that idea that, Oh, if I just get this one, promotion or if I can just find that one partner or whatever the silver bullet kind of experiences that we hope solves all of our problems. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it's just not that. And like, and I think that people of my age, uh, almost 40 come into this experience where they're starting to realize that a key piece of this is being vulnerable and not just with other people, but with themselves, taking an honest look at who they are and what they really want. So this key promotion, you know, it, everybody's telling you that this is this is great, you know, you, you got the promotion or you're up for a promotion and you're supposed to be excited about it, but you're feeling like, ugh, this isn't me. Or I don't really know if I want this. And because you're not able to be vulnerable with yourself, you can't be vulnerable with other people to share because everybody's it seems like everybody's rooting for you. Everybody wants this for you, but do you want it for yourself? And to be able to open yourself up to that kind of 
I don't know what the word is for it. I don't want to quite say rejection, but I know it feels quite like that. That's like rejection of your ideas, of your your thoughts, of what you want to have in your life. Interesting. So by that rejection, do you mean in coming to that place of vulnerability with yourself and then communicating to others, having them potentially reject that? Or do you mean a uh, kind of self-rejection in that, in that context? I think you are right on with both of them. I mean, both of those things mm-hmm. happen. The self-rejection is really interesting because you don't know exactly how to, to fix that. I mean, I know I didn't. I'm going to speak from my own experience, of course. That's why I'm here to speak from my own experience. I had this problem where I thought that all I had to do was appease everyone else. So I grew up as a middle child. So I had an older brother and a younger sister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, there's some things that your older brother, your older sibling can do that you can't. And then there's some things that your younger sister or sibling can do that you that I couldn't do. And so I was like kind of lost, not, not special in any way. I was trying to get some kind of attention. But the best thing I had going for me was that I was kind of smart. Like, so I would get good grades and I grew up in a single parent household. So I'm trying to get some attention, but my parents, my single parent is busy trying to make sure that we're alive. You know, <laughs> we're trying to make sure that we have food and, you know, we come home every day from school, things like that. Like that didn't seem to be a priority, especially, you know, back in that time. So I'm growing up in this atmosphere where sometimes I can get attention by doing whatever other people wanted me to do. And I just grew up with that attitude. Like mm. if I'm smart in school, I get attention from my teachers. Great. If I give things to people, I get attention because that's what, that's all I know how to do. That's all I know how to do. I didn't know how to really be myself. If I were to show myself, I would expect to be ignored. And so when I continue on, I grew up and I go to college and I exhibit the same behavior, I'm doing the same thing. I'm trying to connect with people by doing things for them and it doesn't work. I don't know how to be vulnerable. I don't know how to carry on a conversation. I don't even know what I really want. Only thing I knew was that I didn't want to be alone. And so that was one of those things that really stuck with me and I carried with me up into my 30s. Like I want to be connected to people. And that's, that's why I started the coaching business, that I wanted to be connected to people. And I found out that vulnerability was a big part of it. And I kept hearing about vulnerability, but had no idea what it really was or really, really meant to me. And it just means being able to be honest with yourself about what you want and discovering what you want from yourself. So that's a self-rejection that you were talking about. I don't know how to know what I want. That sounds weird, but I don't, I don't even know how to find it. Like, what do I do to get to it? I, I thought I was supposed to do everything everyone else does because it looks like everyone else has what they need. It looks like everybody is being successful in life. I see people walking with briefcases <laughs> and their ties and their suits and they look great. That's what we all want, right? Ugh. That's such a, it's so interesting how often that concept comes up of everybody else seems to have it all together. I had, I had a buddy on a few weeks ago and we were talking about dating, but it, what he said, I think is so valid and it, it's very similar to what you said that on some level, everyone's operating as if they're trying to be cool in high school, <laughs> you know, like, no matter how old you are, mm-hmm. where you live, you know, these things, I, I guess it's, I can't, I don't know about outside of America, but I would imagine too, there's always that, that level of pro- project an image in a certain way. Mm-hmm. So people see me that way. and. Everyone else is also, I don't know, everyone's just on the same page of trying to figure it out. And I guess some folks are tapped in a little more. Mm-hmm. And like, like you were describing yourself while you were seeking, knowing that maybe there's something more or that eventually in life you realize that, okay, I can't just be a people pleaser and, and mm-hmm. without serving myself. 
And I think that's really cool too, your story, because that term people pleaser is one that I've heard a lot, but I've never actually heard it broken down like that, an example of how this is how it develops. Like this is how for me, I came to this place where I was only deriving self-worth or you know, positive affirmation from doing things for others. You know, it's be- growing up in an environment where, you know, your parent was stressed and, and had a lot on, on their plate and as a, a middle child. So I think that's really cool too. A little, little side tangent. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, I carried that. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, I, I carried that attitude with me for a long time. For sure. So as far as your life, pre-transition, you know, what was your life like at that point? And what were the factors or the feelings that led you to say, okay, I need to make a change here or actually to identify that your physical body was not in alignment with your gender or spirit? Hmm. That's a good question. Please correct me if (laughs) if I'm not (laughs) using the right verbiage. (laughs) (laughs) You're spot on, Thomas. I appreciate I appreciate you, and I appreciate you being uh, careful to consider my feelings. Now that makes me feel like you know this is a safe space. Makes you feel like I could be vulnerable to talk about what I need to here. So, um, in line with my spirit, so. I found that I was, for the most part, I didn't understand why I was the way I was. And this was back in, I don't know, when I was a young teenager. I didn't understand my body, what was going on with it. I know that so I was a, a cis woman at the time. And I didn't understand why I was changing and going through hormones and puberty and stuff and the feeling of my body. Like, I expected to to have muscle. I wanted to have muscle. I wanted to be, I wanted to feel more like a male, a cis male. I remember walking around and copying mannerisms of other men, of other males. You know, I, I hung out, I was a big tomboy. Well, I don't know if that's uh, appropriate to say these days, but I ran around with the guys a whole lot when I was a kid and when I was a young teenager, I never liked any dolls or, or any, anything that was quite feminine. I didn't like anything like that, honestly. And I thought that was just, you know, who I was going to be. And I was expecting to have my body reflect that. And I was very disappointed. (laughs) I was very disappointed when, (laughs) uh, when I had, um, I had a large, D cups and that was awful for me. <laughs> it was awful. Um, oh, I bet. Yeah, I was attracted to women. Yeah. So I know all these things these days don't really show that you are that doesn't there aren't indicators of being transgender. Like your gender, your sexuality doesn't indicate you being transgender. But for me, those were things that just felt real and, and natural. To, to lean in that direction. But I didn't make any kind of change. I didn't have any kind of language for it. Didn't have any understanding of it. And for myself, I just knew I was feeling this way. And I certainly grew up in a small town. So I had in the 90s. So I had no one to express these feelings toward. I mean, being gay, being attracted to women was not a thing that I was able to express either. So I had no no self-awareness or expression or self-expression at all. So I, I moved to college. So I, I was pretty smart. So I, I got into college and I was a couple of hours away and I had to I had an experience of whole new experience, different people, different ideas. And it was fantastic. It was fantastic, but still there. I didn't have the language or the understanding of me. And I still had problems being vulnerable and connecting with other people because I didn't understand myself. So after college, I get a job, and then I realized that I'm still in Ohio, and it's the problem is it's Ohio. The whole state of Ohio is terrible. <laughs> I need to leave. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, well, it's as broad as minded people that I thought I met in college, I thought, well, you know, if I go to California, 
you know, California, that's where the people are. That's where right, the, right. the sun is always shining. <laughs> that's where the blue state, everybody's progressive. I'm going to go there. And I land in the Central Valley. If anybody out there is familiar with it, <laughs> it is, that's a joke. <laughs> I know that that is a joke. It's like the Ohio of <laughs> California. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. And it's big. Mm-hmm. It's like the majority of the state. Yeah. If it, <laughs> <laughs> it is definitely different from San Francisco or 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 uh, LA. They're definitely, they're all distinct places there. Here. But they weren't, I didn't really find too much growth there either. I just found that I couldn't be vulnerable. I can connect with people. So I had a whole new opportunity to reinvent myself. And here I met the same kind of person because I don't know how to, to open up. I don't know how to be uh, connected with other people. And so I don't know if you wanted to interject there, but I just wanted to make sure that. Yeah, I didn't just, drag on. <laughs> yeah. No, you're, you're, you're crushing it. Where in uh where in the Valley did you, did you end up? Oh, I ended up. I ended up in um, Modesto, Modesto, and then I used to work in Patterson. So it was cool. like a commuter. That's pretty, yeah, it's like uh, pretty close to the bay, actually, for the valley, right? Mm-hmm. It's yeah, like an, probably like an hour or two south and in, inland from San Jose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I've been out. I've cool. been out to San Francisco a couple of times. Wonderful. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so. Yeah, that's that's the classic, right? And I think very much like the beginning of the conversation that this idea that maybe just like transitioning, maybe, you know, this idea of moving to California that will fix yeah. or resolve the pain or, or, or whatever the the discomfort that you're yeah. experiencing. And then, yeah, and, and I had that myself too. I, I, I was um, thinking about going and uh, teaching rugby and playing English in China. Uh, a few years back because I had this big, and I still do have this big desire to live abroad. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm actually making plans to do that now again, but I realized too, that, you know, I wasn't necessarily running away from my problems, I would say, but I definitely was, you know, it was COVID time and I was, you know, there were things that were making me uncomfortable psychologically. And I realized at a certain point that, okay, yeah, I can go there, but the, I'm just going to bring my problems with me. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, the things about myself that I don't like and the things that I don't like about my environment here, you know, externally will change, but the stuff inside of me, I'm just going to bring with me. Right, right. And that's really a great point because, you know, when you were saying, when you said that you wanted to travel abroad, like, wow, that's really great. I mean, that's self uh exploration that's growth that's personal growth right but it depends on what you want to get out of the your experiences but it it depends on who you are going to take with you and who you're going to be in your experience so if you're going to be a person who is just repeating the same patterns like i did like the experience of going and creating the same problems that you had and not looking inside even though everything's going to change externally, but how is it going to affect you inside is important, is very important. And so, you know, that's another thing I discovered, man, I've been doing that my entire life. And I'm sure that you understand that we can relate to that. We all can relate to this where we're looking for one thing to solve our problem. We we are going to get a pet. (laughs) One time I I had a (laughs) partner and we were just having some big problems. Same kind of relationship that I'd had before and before. But I'm in my early mid twenties and mid twenties and I'm thinking, well well, uh, not one to have kids really. So let's get a pet. And we did and things didn't get better between us. It was just a distraction. It was just a distraction. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> so strange. <laughs> so strange. So strange. Totally, totally. Yeah. Moving house, getting a dog buying a boat, whatever, like, <laughs> like buying boat, <laughs> trying a new job. And that, that's, that's what it comes when you, you're listening to other people and they're trying to give you solutions to what you, they think that you want, what, what makes them happy. 
or what they think you should have. Totally. And taking on those ideas like, oh, yeah, do this. This is going to help. Not, not, not really. Not inside. Doesn't feel good for me inside. And so, you know, I had another opportunity to move from California to Chicago, where I am now. And I thought, there's one thing I'm going to do differently. I'm going to go and be a different person. I I'm, I thought that uh, if I went alone, so I actually moved from Ohio to California with a person. I thought if I go alone it's from California to Chicago, this is it. This is the thing. I, I was just so scared before, but if I go here and I, I be by myself and I meet people by myself, then I'm going to be a whole new person. And of course, it didn't work. It didn't, it didn't work. I found myself in the same kind of situation, the same kind of people. And this was before I transitioned. So I'm still finding myself in those situations. Like, what am I doing? What am I doing? So this is where the introspection really had to happen. Like, why am I not being honest with my, or why am I having these problems? It's because I'm not being honest with myself. And Well, I discovered that there are there were three there are three things. Well, there there to being vulnerable. Like, what what do you do to get that kind of introspection? You know, you sit down. You maybe you'll journal and you write about your ideas. You write about how you feel about things. I know that was something that was helpful for me. I went to therapy and I actually learned about cognitive behavioral therapy and talking about my feelings. And understanding how my actions relate to my feelings and really understanding me. And through this process, I learned about being vulnerable is so uncomfortable. I learned how being vulnerable is so uncomfortable, especially facing this rejection to towards somebody that you really like or something that you really want to happen. It just doesn't happen. And I felt myself just melt inside. And I wanted to control that, let's say, <laughs> control how I felt about vulnerability, or at least be a little more cautious about how vulnerable I'm being with other people. And so through self-discovery, I discovered that there are three things that I need. And well, the three things that I need to know about my, my boundaries. So, you know, when you're creating this vulnerability, I created these boundaries that would help me be safer around other people. So I'm not just letting people in and feeling so raw and vulnerable that all they have to do is give me a thumbs down and I, I die. I don't, <laughs> I don't want that to happen because that has <laughs> happened before, especially when you're first starting to create these boundaries, starting to understand these boundaries with yourself and what you want. And so I discovered three things. They're your needs, they're your negotiables, and then your, they're your nevers. There are things that you absolutely need people to do for you they absolutely need to happen for you that if you don't say or speak, if you just assume that they know, or if you can't verbalize them, they're not going to do them for you. And you're going to fill yourself with resentment. And then there are your negotiables. There are things that you might not like that people do, but you can be okay with them. There are things that you might not like that people will say to you. Eh, it's okay. It doesn't have to bother you doesn't have to ruin your day. They can still be friends. You can still be connected with them. And then there are your nevers. And they're different for every person. Your nevers, they're things that you absolutely do not want someone to do. And you have to be, this is the thing, you have to be more than willing to break off this connection if they do one of those things. And a lot of people try to mm. push everything into the negotiables, negotiable category. Everything's not negotiable. You pretend. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? I want you to like me. <laughs> I want you to like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's so true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I really like that because it's a nice, it's a nice way to kind of conceptualize too. So needs, negotiables, and nevers. Mm -hmm. I like that. And the way you discover those, you know, just for your own self-reflection, the things don't ignore the things that you are feeling angry about. Don't ignore those things. Don't ignore things you really like, you have joy for, you know, you can't just, I mean, you can try your best to hold back, but you're just going to build up resentment and you're not going to be able to share who you are and what you really want from other people. 
Awesome. So you have to, so someone has to know themselves really well to bring that true self to, to the other people and kind of bring that true self to other people is what builds rich and fulfilling relationships and friendships. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, you know, as I was saying before we got into this, before my transition, I was struggling with all of that. And I thought that, well, I came to Chicago and I made my transition. So I was later in life, I was able to do it a lot faster than most young people, but I was able to add insurance and, and things to get me medically transitioned, my name changed and all the, the, the things that go with it. And I thought, this is perfect. And I even had a girlfriend at the time who knew I was transitioning, who helped me through the transition. So this is great. My life is going to be perfect. Copacetic after that. And of course, it was not. <laughs> Surprise, <laughs> man. That's so weird. <laughs> I didn't. The silver bullet didn't work. Didn't, didn't work. <laughs> I mean, I thought I had all the things together and it just didn't work. So I, I discovered that those three ends, the needs, negotiables, and nevers, I discovered those after. And I had communicate, I had trouble communicating them because now, being transitioned put me in a position where I had a whole new body and some more new insecurities. What if people don't accept me? Like I'm already having trouble being accepted, but now I have to explain my body to them. Like women are talking to me, but I'm afraid to be close to them. I'm afraid to express anything to them because, well, I'm not who you are, who you think I am underneath. And it was really difficult to, to express that. So I guess one of my nevers is, you know, acceptance of my body. There's, so, I, mean, I can't have a relationship mm. if someone wants me to change that, it just won't happen. But being able to express it and being able to walk away was so hard. So I'm, I'm meeting people online and I'm trying to chat them up. And I don't quite say that I'm a uh, transgendered off the top. I don't do that because I'm afraid of that rejection. When we have conversation, everything's nice and I have a great personality to them. They have a great personality to me, but then, oops, I've got to tell them about this thing that I didn't tell them about. And then they disappear. And this happened so much that I'm just like this. I'm wasting so much time. I'm wasting their time. I'm wasting my time. And this isn't fair. I'm not being vulnerable, I'm not being open. I'm not being real with them because if I'm going to have an intimate relationship, then that's one of those things that is expected. Right. So they have to, they have to be able to accept who I am. I have to be able to verbalize who I am and my expectations and how I feel about it. And I also have to be able to accept this rejection that comes with it. There's so much rejection that comes with it. And that's, that's fine. I mean, I have to change my mindset to believe that it's what I want and it's what they want. If they don't want me, then I don't want them. If they want me to be somebody else, I don't want them. I have to be okay with who I am. And so that has come after some some time and some introspection with being transitioned. So I think I've been transitioned for about seven years now. And... um I didn't fully come into feeling this comfortable until I'm still working on it. Honestly, you know, I didn't get a chance to go out in the pandemic, but I'm still working on being comfortable with me and who I am. Amazing. Oh my gosh. That's so healthy. That mindset of if they don't want me, I don't want them. And yeah, this, Again, kudos to you. Extremely impressive that you can, you, you kind of went through that and can communicate it and stand up for yourself. And I think that <clears throat> the, that, that line about changing the mindset, it's a, it's a one, it's a testament to the power of the mind and, you know, that you were able to harness it for your own benefit. And then also, I just think there are so many people stuck in relationships where they are not being served or their partners is are not honoring the things about themselves that are unchangeable 
you know, and, and instead of having a mindset like, okay, well, this person doesn't give me what I need or resents this part of me or doesn't support or endorse or love this part of me, but you know, I'll make, I'll make that a negotiable, right? I'll, I won't, I won't have that be a never. So I think that's such a powerful message for, for everyone. And yeah, I just amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, also you said about, um, it's not fair, right? In that scenario, like you, you know, on someone online with somebody, you know, it's not fair to them. It's not fair to me. It's not fair to you that you have to navigate this social landmine obstacle course to just be who you're, who you're, who you are, who you are, you know, that's not fair, dude. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, yeah, I understand. <laughs> I, <laughs> <laughs> obviously. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but just like, just like conceptually, it's like, it's, uh, it's crazy. Like you, you know, the, so much, so much hoops and red tape and these things just so you can kind of be, be yourself. And yeah. So I just want to acknowledge that and, you know, give you a shout out on that, well, you know, as far as. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I think, I feel like it's a, uh, it has to be the same. I, I just believe it has to be the same for everyone out there who isn't being uh, vulnerable and isn't being mm-hmm. authentic to themselves because, this experience of dating is just the worst. I mean, okay, there's COVID of course, but just dating in general, I think it's, it's hard. We're always trying to impress somebody. They said there's always trying to be, um, impress somebody from high school. Like we're in high school or something like that, trying to show that we are the person you, we think you want us to be. And that's just a distraction. Yeah. Totally. So, Central to all of this is this idea of being authentic, being vulnerable. And with that comes true friendships, people who have your back when you need it, you know, who aren't just there in the sunny days, but Mm -hmm. are there to love and support us when we really need it. Um, So how would you, actually, before we get to that too, are there any folks from your life pre-transition who friends who kind of stepped up and, and kind of came with you on the journey? Yeah. There's a couple that I can think of that, um, you know, throughout my, before my transition, I know I've lost touch with people. So I had a habit of, of connecting with a college friend or friends in California. And then I lost touch with them when I moved because I was trying to build a new life and thinking, well, leaving all that stuff behind, I don't need it. But when I resurfaced and somehow we connected, I don't know, through Facebook, somebody's birthday or, or whatnot. It's like, just thinking about them. I sent them a text, they respond and, and we were able to, and this is how I knew that they were really good friends and worth, you know, continuing to talk to is because I could tell them, of course, about this big transition and they seem to be okay with it and they seem to support me with it. And they were just asking about my well being, but also, I discovered that what maintains the friendship is talking about little things that happen every day, the little things. So there's this huge event. Oh, you transitioned. It's great. You know, celebratory or, Oh, you had kids or you got married. It's great. It's celebratory. It's a big event, but I really get to know. And I really get to share when I talk about the little things that happen every day, I'm talking about, the things that you may think is boring, like you think that they don't want to hear about them. They don't want to hear about how you, I don't know, had spinach and <laughs> for dinner or something like that. <laughs> something they didn't want. They do want to hear about those things, the things that make right. up who you are, the habitual things that make up who you are, because that is who you are. It's not these big events that happened. There were a series of little dates, conversations, and things that you had before you got married, before you had kids, before you decided to make those decisions. And it's within those little details is who you are. And so sharing those things. So that's why that's I really learned that those people who were along for the big celebratory thing, they were there for the little things too. And that's how I know that they're they're worth keeping and they're close. That's the same for everyone else. That's where you make your friendships. It's in the details. 
I love that. I love that. It makes sense because, you know, using like an analogy of a container, you know, it's the, it's the everyday activities that fill up the container, not the, not the Instagram activities, you know, that yeah. people use to throw up and kind of make a splash. But yeah, that's so true. I, I find myself, you know, not sharing that stuff sometimes. I think maybe if I'm tired or, you know, like, like my, my thing is playing rugby. Like I always play rugby. And so it's like, you know, if my friends ask me like, Oh, how was the rugby game or how's training? You know, it's like, Oh, it was good. You know, but if they're, they're my friend, they're asking cause they care. And I should probably go into more detail. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah. You know, if they're only asking about rugby too, it's like, well, what else is there about you? I mean, it's probably tired. It probably, you probably had all that excitement about rugby left on the field, you know, just like, Ugh, I'm, I'm done talking about rugby right now. And there's something else that you could chat about. How's your podcast? I don't know. Do people ask you about your podcast? Because I know that. They do. They do. <laughs> they do. They do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, they're very supportive about the podcast. <laughs> yeah. If these questions like, well, what did you do today? I mean, that a lot of that is a, it's a hard, sometimes a hard question for people to answer. What did you do today? Oh, nothing. But there's some detail in, in what you did. I mean, you got up today and you ran a mile. I'm not running a mile. I didn't do that today. No, I didn't do that today. You got up today and you went to McDonald's and had a cup <laughs> of coffee and some cheese, uh, I don't know, cheese biscuits or something, whatever they serve there. That's what you did. That's, that's your personality. There's something in there talking about those little things. And <laughs> it is. I am a cheese biscuit. Cheese biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> You know, they. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Like, uh, what people eat as far as the personalities, you know, like, or like, what, you know, if you're with, at a, a dinner with a group of people and, you know, what everyone orders, mm. it's kind of like a silent, a silent judgment. Like, oh, like, <laughs> who got the burger? Who got the salad? <laughs> yeah. You know, I am like one of those. People who, if you invite me to dinner, I'm like a tapas kind of, it turns into tapas for me. So everybody's going to share. I'm, I'm going to ask people to to try this and try that and see if I can <laughs> share, like so I can try a little bit of what they have. I can share a little bit of what I have. You know, I'm one of those kind of like trying to eat off everybody else's plate. <laughs> Family style. Mm-hmm. I love it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we've identified those those rich, positive friendships. How would you go about coaching someone to develop those friendships or make, you know, real authentic connections with people? Well, that's a great question. I thank you for asking. So I, I would walk them through the process that, that I went through myself is first discovering what my values are, what really is important to me. So I, I recall having a relationship in which I tried to set a boundary. So these are boundaries. These are what's important to you. These are things that your needs, negotiables, and nevers. And I used to have this long commute. So I would say, don't come over until, you know, at least an hour after I got home. And they kept showing up like right as I got home, right as I got home. And I didn't, I didn't fix that. I thought, well, they must really like me a whole lot, you know? So I thought, well, I'm not going to leave that behind. I, I'm not going to try and fix that, but it was really important to me to have my space, my me time. I worked all day and now I want some time to just breathe. And I didn't get that. And I felt really frustrated by that whole thing. So what is it my, what is it that I really value? So I would look, I would ask my clients to look back at those kind of things and I would ask them some questions. Like, well, some, some to help them get started. Like, what do you, for what are you, most grateful in your life? And this question is supposed to get you thinking about what you cherish. What's really important to you? What are you most grateful for? And then if you could change anything about the way you were raised, what would it be? So this, mm. this question is one that helps you discover what your family values are and what your relationship is, what your relationship dynamics are, and what they're going to be, because you're going to think about those things. You're going to feel those things. What makes you feel important? So I would get them started with those kind of questions to get them understanding what their values are. And then we're going to start verbalizing our values. We're going to set them down. What are your needs, negotiables, and nevers? 
And those are for yourself too. What do you need for yourself? What do you need from yourself? And that's how we'll get started with that. We'll, we'll start talking about what those are and verbalizing to other people. And that's how you'll, you'll see people come in your life and you'll see people come out of your life. If you have these values, if you value a, a cheese biscuit, <laughs> then, you know, <laughs> what are you doing to go get that? What are you doing to go get that? What are you doing to, to make that happen? Because if you are going to get a cheese biscuit, let's say you won't go to a place that doesn't have them to go to where they are. You have to realize that I want the thing. So I need to go to the place and be in the place where it's more likely I'll find what I need. So that's how I help people make friendships. Amazing. I love, love, love those questions. Cause wow. It's so it's, it's so, yeah, like you said, uh, an insight or a window into what we value. And I think it is kind of funny to think about starting a, starting off a friendship, like a speed dating friendship, like, Hey Lee, I'm Thomas and I really value <laughs> treating other people kindly and talking about problems and not brushing them under the rug, you know, but honestly, if someone wants to be my friend, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, that's what I need. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. And it is weird to talk about it like that. So we would structure that into some conversation. <laughs> we would think like, what do people do that show that they really are interested in Thomas? What do they ask about? What is important to Thomas? What do they, how do they behave? So people would ask about things that are important to you. They would come to you and say, hey, what's, how's your podcast going? Or how are you feeling today? Oh, are you sick? Then let me, can I help you out? Or what can I bring for you? Things like that. Looking into those behaviors, because do you know what you, you feel when someone is doing those things? Of like, this feels good. This is right. This is, I feel cared for. And you won't necessarily, you know, ask to do these things, but you will be able to observe and feel for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You can yeah. tell. Yeah, you can tell. Yeah. And it's just, bringing that to your awareness. Hey, this is what I really want. Are they doing those things? This is non-negotiable. This is non-negotiable. It's non-negotiable. Yeah. I, I think it's, I'm just always amazed by how so many things on the path to happiness or a better life or a better mindset or psyche are start with what's happening inside. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just amazing that understanding ourselves and really taking a deep look and, and, and being on another thing that you said that was really, I found really cool was being honest with ourselves about who we are, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's like the, it's like the, you know, I haven't been through a, an, like an addiction program or anything like that, but. I believe from there was this process of kind of acknowledging the situation or acknowledging the issue as a, as a, a vital first step and actually mm -hmm. verbalizing it and saying it, you know, and, and acknowledging that, Hey, like whatever's going on in my life right now that I'm unhappy with, like it's happening. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's time that I, it's time, it's time, high time for me to, to say it out loud and, and name it. Yes, absolutely. And that's what I, I believe that it starts with all the things that, I think that happened with me too when looking for um, you know, genuine connections and people to, to really understand me. This is what's happening. I'm moving, but nothing's happening. I'm going, but things aren't changing. Why are they still the same? What What's happening with it? And verbalizing it really helps. You know, the, uh, the connections, they all start with, they all start with me. I have a, a course actually on creating connections. It's a free course out there. So um, your audience is more than welcome to sign up for it. But when you complete the course, you'll understand more about your connections and how they start. They begin with me. So I call them me and then you, which is me and another person. And then we, which is group dynamics. So everything starts with me and how you behave with yourself and treat yourself. And then it permeates outward. So just like you said, and understanding and speaking about what you feel and what you know, what, what's happening. It all starts with me. It all starts with me. Amazing. Thank you for creating that and sharing that course. I'm definitely 
go check it out. Awesome. I, yeah, I th- one one of my nevers in a in a relationship, whether it's you know with my partner or with friends, is that if someone has issues or has you know things about themselves they don't like or an unhealthy habit or self care they're falling short on, and they repeatedly acknowledge it but don't do anything about it. Oh, that's something I've I've seen before. Like I, I've had to cut off friendships before of. Like, hey, like, I'm really sorry, you know, and, I, and like, I see the light in you and I and I love you, but you're not taking care. So, no, sorry, I'm not saying you, you know, this person is not mm-hmm. taking care of themselves and it's toxic to be around and I can't, I can't be party to it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I completely understand that you, it, it feels so, uh, feels so awful. Honestly, I think to experience this. And if you're a supportive friend and you want to see the best for your friends and you just can continually see them hurt themselves or do things that don't benefit themselves, it doesn't make you feel good at all. And then you know that there's nothing that you can do about it. You can't change their behavior. The only thing that you can do is move yourself in the situation. So man, I would say kudos to you for, for doing that. But also I know how painful it is and acknowledging that pain behind it. That didn't feel good. For sure. Thank you. Yeah. No, I think maybe we're somewhere in this way, just, you know, kind of like, you know, positive bouncing around, talking to everybody, making friends with people. But along the way, you know, there are the situations where you meet someone who is great, but is like, can't really, can't really support that behavior. Sorry. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And that's really important to say, you know, I honestly, I wanted this to, to make this quick distinction and and note this and pull this out because you said you can't support the behavior and you separate that from the person itself. If not, they're not a bad person. It's that they have behaviors. They have things that they're doing that don't benefit them. And you notice, or, or things that don't feel good to you. And you don't want to be a party to that. And you absolutely have the, the right to do that. I just wanted to say that you didn't, put that on them as a person. And I, I think that's really great to distinguish between people and the things that they do. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Cause that's, a, this is the fine line of this self work process, you know, is like for me, at least I've uncovered things that make me draw boundaries. So it's like, how do, how do we bless you? <clears throat> how do we draw boundaries empathetically and do it in a way that's not creating more damage too? you know, that, that, that could be a whole, that could be a whole podcast conversation. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great one because you do have these ne- needs, negotiables and nevers. And it's just like, you just, you, you want to keep the door open a bit or you want to, let's say it's not even about keeping the door open. It's about, Delivering the message that's authentic to you. It's not that you don't like this person and their entity and their being. It's that they're the behaviors and you have to set an, a boundary with those behaviors because um, there are going to be some nevers that you have with people that you still want to be friends with. There just are. And you have to be able to communicate that to them. There's some behaviors that I never want to see you do again ever, but I want to be your friend. We're cool. I still like you. You know, you have to be able to set that. That That's a really great point. I'm writing that down. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Awesome, Lee. We'll, we'll jump over to the three things game. All right. For the listeners out there, the, the three things game is almost retired. I, I ordered a new conversation game. So you're uh, one of the last one of the last to to play this this version. All right, I get um, to be part of this legacy. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, what month is your birthday, Emily? It's March. March. Yeah. Awesome. Happy birthday month. Thank you. Awesome. It's coming soon. Okay. Cool. So you're up. Awesome. So you're up. You're up soon or up first because uh, your birthday sooner. So you have a question. I'll, I'll hold it up to the screen. And then I will answer a separate question. Okay. Okay. Cool. Here we go. 
what are three ways you define wealth? All right, three ways to define wealth. Well, wealth that I, is the new health, I suppose. So being healthy is one of those ways to define it. Um, I would say in my my self my self worth self worth. I'm looking for the worth in this, but uh, self worth. Like so, how I feel about myself. You know, I feel about myself is is really important being depressed and trying to people please throughout my most of my life. But like that's really feeling, I really need to feel like that. Um, let's see what else, uh, wealth. I don't know. I'm thinking about, Oh, I would say my connections and my friendships that the one doesn't come straight to my head, but the people that I have around to support me once upon a time, I had no one who, could be an emergency contact. So, so important for me to have people around. Mm. Yeah, so that's it. Um, health, uh, my self-worth and connections with others. Mm, beautiful. I'm so happy you have those people now, <laughs> Thank you. you know, to be those emergency contacts. That's amazing. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. My question is what are three things I would like to share with my younger self? Well, I'm still young. This not <laughs> to like <laughs> not to rub it in with me. <laughs> but no, just to just to be self aware that I'm still growing and you know, this is I'm gonna be a very different person in ten years, I think. But uh first would be just to not be so cocky. I think looking back, you know, I, I was a nice I'm I was a nice kid and nice guy, but definitely way overconfident and just like thought I was the coolest, the coolest person ever. And that's not the case. So (laughs) I would would tell myself to calm down. Uh, I I would, I would give myself props for all of the hard work I was putting into training and, and trying to, you know, be a better rugby player because it really paid off in the sense that, all of the confidence it built and all of the experiences I've had from playing sports. And now at this point I've developed into a really well-rounded athlete, which I never, ever, ever would have seen when I was 13 years old. You know, I was always overweight and mm. unathletic, wow. you know, and like not talented playing sports and I stuck with it and now I can play and now I'm like good. So yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And then number three, I would just say to myself, also, I think to, you know, just keep working hard in school because uh, lifelong learning, I think, is, is is an awesome habit to get into. And I still am, I tell myself that now too, to keep pushing, keep learning. You know, I learn a lot through the podcast, but I think reading and kind of being intentional about what I read is, is a good thing to keep keep in mind. Mm. I definitely concur with that. Awesome. Lifelong learning. Awesome, Lee. Well, thank you so much for an absolutely wonderful conversation and, and coming here with an open heart and an open mind and, and sharing your story. Um, where can the folks check out your, your work or, or if they want to, if they want to learn from that course you have, uh, where, where should they, where should they head? Oh yeah. So thanks for having me, Thomas. I mean, I really enjoyed this conversation. It was really wonderful to connect with you. You know, I probably should have asked you more, a little bit about rugby, but I, I felt, oh, I felt a little bit self-conscious about it. Honestly, now this is at the end of the, the show. This is at the end of the show, but, um, I hope uh-huh. to base with you about it. I played rugby um as a female and so i was like oh dope yeah so i was like oh i don't know if i want to talk about that but (laughs) (laughs) it's it's so different and i just felt so self-conscious but i mean here i am being vulnerable at the end of the show yeah yeah but we'll we'll connect that hopefully hopefully again we'll be able to connect and talk more about it because i'm yeah i'm curious about uh you know your experiences with it and um so you asked me where I could find, where everyone can find me. You can find me at patterns of 
dot com slash more possibility. That's where I have my course, my free course. You can click on the link and go to the course. And then I also have uh, 10 uh, tips to create memorable conversations. So I know that we're all trying to connect with each other and we want these conversations to not fizzle out. We want them to be interesting. I want to share a little bit more about us. So I shared the um, 10 tips that I found to keep us engaged in conversation. And then again, you could find me at patternsofpossibility.com slash more possibility. There you'll find the links to my social media as well. Awesome. Well, I hope, I hope this drives some visitors to your site and I definitely will be checking your content. And um, if you had a podcast, I would totally listen to it also. So, Oh, I do have a podcast, but I haven't. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I, I, I honestly have not, um, I have not updated for a while because I wanted to get, uh, I got too, too, too excited about the podcast and I had three different kinds of formats. So when I started doing these podcasts again, maybe I'll have you as a guest because I had a guest. I also had a part where I was telling stories about my life. So I think if you're going to listen to the podcast, the one you want to listen to is all fakes are fools. And other things are all fakes are not fools and other things are true. And so I talk about what it is to be scared and not be vulnerable with people because you're afraid to be rejected. So I share my story about what happened to me and I do it with music. And so I put a bit of music in there and take care to, to share my real authentic self in that. So, um, you know, that was a great a plug there for me, Thomas. I appreciate you bringing it up. I didn't. <laughs> for sure. I thought you were. I'm stoked. I thought you were saying like, yo, in, talk about your podcast. Like, Cause I know you've had podcasts like, Oh, I didn't know that, but um, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm excited to check it out. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you. Awesome. Coach Lee. Well, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time on the pod. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thank you.